Uh, bien, uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, welcome to the Victoria Forum. Uh, my name is uh, Sébastien Bourdieu. I'm a career diplomat. I'm adjunct uh, professor at uh, UVic and I'm associate co-chair of the uh, Victoria Forum. The Victoria Forum is a partnership between uh, the University of Victoria and the uh, Senate of Canada. Il me fait grand plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue au Forum de Victoria. Uh, votre participation des, des quatre coins du monde aujourd'hui, uh, c'est-à-dire ce matin, ce midi ou ce soir, uh, témoigne de la portée du Forum de Victoria et des thèmes uh, que nous abordons, toujours sous l'angle et le défi de combler uh, les clivages. Wherever you're uh, dialing in from uh, to join us today, uh, your presence underscores the reach of the Victoria Forum, uh, but also the, the challenges that we gave ourselves in uh, bridging divides. Uh, today's theme, uh, Reclaiming Populism, is a very timely topic, and we look forward to hearing uh, today's panel. Uh, but we, before we, we move on, as a uh, uh, associated with the, the Victoria Forum, as a diplomat, uh, I need to say a, a word on, on Ukraine, uh, as this is a, a dark day for, uh, for diplomacy and inter international uh, relations. Our thoughts and prayers are with the people of, uh, of Ukraine, and we deplore the blatant disregard for international norms and standards and the rules-based international system. This situation underscores the importance of the theme of the Victoria Forum, bridging divides. We will continue to address these divides, be they economic, social, environmental, or geopolitical. And these themes will be revisited again at the biennial forum uh, that we'll be holding at the end of August uh, in Victoria. Avant de passer au, au panel, uh, je voudrais souligner que l'actualité du jour nous, nous interpelle, c'est-à-dire les manchettes autour de, de l'Ukraine. C'est un jour sombre pour la, pour la diplomatie. Uh, C'est un jour sombre, sombre aussi pour les relations internationales et puis nos pensées sont avec uh, les gens uh, de l'Ukraine. On déplore les violations des normes internationales, mais la situation souligne, je crois, uh, l'importance du thème uh, du Forum de Victoria, c'est-à-dire combler uh, les clivages. Nous continuons de travailler sur ces clivages économiques, sociaux et environnementaux et évidemment géopolitiques. Donc, les thèmes que nous continuerons d'explorer lors du Forum biennial, uh, et on vous convie à Victoria à la fin. Let me now uh, turn it over to, uh, to Paul Somerville, who's a colleague at the University of Victoria, co-author of uh, Reclaiming Populism, and most importantly, uh, the moderator for today's event. Donc, à vous uh, la parole, uh, Mr. Somerville. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning. I'm uh, Paul Somerville, an adjunct professor uh, here at Gustafson. I'd like to thank the Victoria Forum for organizing today's webinar, Reclaiming Populism to Bridge Divides, the panelists and our moderator. While there are many issues that populism speaks to, uh, the purpose of today is to focus on two things, why populism strikes hard and what to do about it. Too often discussions of populism get caught up in the latest explanation, be it social media, immigration truck drivers, instead of carefully or quantitatively assessing its defining cause. Happily for today, this is exactly the framing that Eric Protzer and I use in our new book, Reclaiming Populism, How Economic Fairness Can Win Back Disenchanted Voters, published by Polity Books. Early into our book's journey in 2019, Eric and I discovered that the political debate did not adequately speak to economic fairness. This insight opened the door to prove that the main theories of what causes populism were wrong, particularly income inequality and immigration, leading us to focus on the centrality of economic fairness. As Eric will discuss, our book shows that a combination of policy failures have in key high-income countries, both weaken the extent to which opportunity is equal and reward is according to contribution. Two important consequences are low social mobility and high vulnerability to economic shocks. Thus, the life chances of an important share of the population are to a large extent predetermined by the income of their parents, leading many citizens to conclude that the system is rigged. All other explanations in countries where populist eruptions have occurred only amplify the underlying discontent. This understanding is at the heart of the populist challenge. Eric and I argue that to rebuild fair, socially mobile economies, policymakers and politicians must embrace the twin virtues of equal opportunity and fair, unequal outcomes. From this twinning comes a long list of critical public policy choices that also speak 
to the role and responsibilities of private companies. Countries that succeed with this twinning are today highly socially mobile and populism resistant, Canada among them. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, the honorable former Senator Jim Munson is well known as a trusted journalist and communications advisor. Canadians of my generation will remember his reports from everywhere in the world where politics was hot in his role as bureau chief and foreign correspondent for CTV News, as well as his reporting during the time the federal government of Canada resorted to emergency measures to tap down domestic discontent. My guess is that if Jim were still in that role, he would today be somewhere on the Russian-Ukrainian border, having just flown in from Ottawa. Jim was called to the Senate in 2003 to represent the province of Ontario. His leadership in Parliament led to the adoption of an act respecting World Autism Awareness Day and the landmark Senate report, Pay Now or Pay Later, Autism Families in Crisis. The organizers and panelists are delighted they can be here today. Jim? Well, thank you very much, Paul. And I really, first of all, would like to express my own sentiments. And I think on behalf of all senators of what is taking place in the, the Ukraine today, uh, we, our thoughts and prayers are certainly with the people of Ukraine. And Paul, um, your recent book with Eric, uh, Reclaiming Populism, is in my view a must read. Uh, as you mentioned, in my many years as a reporter, whether it was domestically or internationally, I was always curious about the ordinary person and what was down that next road. And uh, we've seen the last two days what is down this awful road in political decision making. Um, as we deal with populism, it seems to me that we've reached a critical point on the definition of populism. When I was a reporter, I didn't see it in those days for 30 odd years, but perhaps it was percolating underneath. Now, I always like to uh, keep things uh, simple. So I looked up in the dictionary, uh, the definition of populism. Populism, a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. Well, we had quite a momentous time here in Ottawa with the, the truck convoy over the last month. And it's left me wondering whether this protest was the result of people feeling disregarded by the political establishment or was it something else? In any case, what makes our work here interesting today with uh, our three esteemed panelists, uh, that there is a debate even among ac academics uh, and populism is sometimes difficult to define. Uh, internationally, as we know, populism has been used to describe uh, regimes such as Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, anti-communism in Poland, the Trump mega movement in the United States, and the power grab in Tunisia. So the exchanges today will hopefully shed light on this complex situation uh, in our own country and in other countries, and what has taken place in all of these countries. Some of the questions we will have is, that can the present government defend the liberal democracy and govern in a way that can stand up to the forces of populism and the dangers of increasing loss of trust in our institutions? And I've been thinking about this. How do our political leaders acknowledge and show compassion for those who are frustrated and angry, but at the same time, stand and defend the institutions and the policies that make our country, in my view, one of the best to live in? I have limited research, but I've discovered that populism today is often found in right-wing movements, ideas, leaders, or even parties. There is lots of debate, but in general, people agree that populism has two core principles. One, it claims to speak on behalf of ordinary people, people who have feel they've been left behind with nowhere to go in the new world order. And two, these ordinary people uh, stand in opposition to an elite uh, establishment. Populism appears often on the political right and is viewed as leading to authoritarianism and, in many cases, anti-immigration ideas. And populists can be disruptive. They position themselves as outsiders who are radically different and separate from the existing order. Now, they often do this by promoting a sense of crisis, uh, whether true or not, and presenting themselves as having the solution to the crisis. It has been written, populists often want to transform the status quo, ostensibly in the name of the people, and they can appear threatening to the democratic norms and societal customs many people value. 
that's just the opening and setting the tone for today. But what, whether it's defining populism, the dangers of populism, and the solution in dealing with populism, we at the Victoria Forum are always focusing on bridging divides. Our panelists, we have uh, three panelists today, and they come at this and from different perspectives. Uh, Sachi Curl, for example, her expertise is in engaging public opinion at the Angus Reid Institute and giving us a better understanding of the viewpoints of citizens. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Nabli certainly has a lived experience with populism in Tunisia. And Eric Kratzer, uh, Paul's colleague, from this academic uh, perspective has done extensive research on populism. So you can also find their bios at the victoriaforum.ca. So without uh, further ado, because the moderator shouldn't get in the way of this conversation, uh, help hopefully nurture it along a bit. Uh, Sachi Curl, president of the Angus Reed Institute. Sachi. I think you may be muted. Not for the last time <laughs> will we begin by saying you're on mute. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Good day, and thank you for joining. Um, I wish to keep my statements fairly brief and really just sort of set up where we are as a country and where we are as a population around issues of populism. Um, I have spent my career talking to Canadians, uh, whether as uh, the Honourable Mr. Munson in, in my role as a, as a past journalist or currently in my role uh, talking to Canadians in the aggregate uh, in terms of pu uh, public opinion and understanding uh, that at a broader level. I will say a few things. Um, we can sometimes in Canada be what I would say slightly tongue in cheek, uh, typically Canadian in our reaction to these things, which is to, to throw our hands up uh, in surprise uh, or in mortification when we see rumblings or signs of or manifestations of populism in this country. And, and I would like uh, this morning uh, to make an impassioned plea for us not to do that anymore because not for the first time are we seeing these types of behaviors and not for the last time will we see them. I am not an expert in the subject area in the same way that uh, Messrs. Uh, Somerville and Protzer are, but what I can tell you is we, we have a tendency in this country to look at things the way we wish to view them or the way we view them ourselves as opposed to recognizing what is. Uh, and I see this very often, and I've seen it most recently in uh, some of the hot takes and early coverage, particularly of uh, the convoy itself, where um, there was misunderstanding or disbelief that so many people could be so angry about something. And indeed, it's important to underscore that we have had for many years in Canada uh, a fairly significant level of disengagement within pockets of our population um, that tends to be uh, a regional level of disengagement and more increasingly now a rural urban split around uh, perceptions of engagement or being on the inside or the outside of society. So You've heard words like Western alienation before. We certainly know that many of the people who were uh, part of the convoy were coming from places such as Saskatchewan and Alberta. It's also important to remember though that many were coming from Quebec. So we understand that if you're outside of the cities and perhaps not subscribing to some of the values norms that urban or younger Canadians are uh, subscribing to, uh, you see Canada moving in, in a direction uh, that is perhaps uncomfortable, that perhaps plays into insecurities or a sense of loss of entitlement uh, in Canadian society. And uh, that that is something we've seen. I don't want to spend too much time ascribing uh, why or what the underlying issues are because I am of the view rightly or wrongly, that, that the issues are a little bit more fluid and it is the manifestation of that level of disengagement that is the consistent thing. So when we talk to Canadians and 60% of them 
tell us, and you can find these data uh, on our website at the Angus Reid Institute, when 60% say they don't believe that uh, their priorities are reflected in terms of what's happening in Ottawa or their federal government, when 45% say that they do not believe that Canada's system of government is a good one, when they reflect opinions that show that they don't necessarily see uh, democracy strengthening but weakening in this country, and when we have had because of our parliamentary uh, system federally, two consecutive elections where uh, a government mandate, uh, a government is formed and, and a mandate is claimed when the winning party has in fact actually lost by a sliver, the popular vote. Um, that level of disengagement uh, not only uh, deepens and intensifies, but it also grows. Um, this is what we're seeing in real time and whether it's uh, um, manifested through disagreements over natural resource uh, production and and investment in this country whether it manifests itself through what we saw a couple of years ago with the yellow vest protests or now with the trucker convoy certainly social media, Fox News, all of the, the usual tropes about why it's getting worse or why it feels like it's getting worse, we can point to those things. But the seeds of populism, um, the, the existence uh, is, is there. And what we're finding now are perhaps seemingly more frequent opportunities for disgruntled folks to give voice to the things that they are disgruntled, angry, insecure about. Um, so I will leave it there because I think there's a lot of ground to cover. But just in terms of where Canadians are today, when you hear your politicians saying Canadians have never been more united or Canadians have never been more divided, I would say, please uh, don't don't give in to uh, reductionist political speech. Uh, both things can be true. We can be very united about some issues such as vaccination. We can be divided about other issues, which is the best policy for the country going forward. And uh, and, and I, I leave with an impassioned plea for greater critical thought around these things. Well, thank you, Sachi. Uh, they're very revealing numbers for us to discuss later on uh, with, our, with the, the panel today. And thank you very much for that. Uh, next up is uh, the, the, the Dr. Um, Mustafa Camille Nabli, and uh, he's a former governor of the of the Central Bank of Tunisia and uh, Minister of Economy. And uh, Mustafa, I you know we we've looked at Tunisia over the last many years with uh, first of all the, the day of democracy, and then trouble began shortly after that. You have a lived experience. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thanks for the organizers to uh, invite me to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, I, have been, I have been in the uh, development uh, domain for many, many years, for 50 years. Uh, in, uh, for someone uh, whose career, both in academia and in the, polit in the policy uh, domains, uh, has been about development, uh, mostly in the Middle East and North Africa region, not very long ago. Populism was a peculiar phenomenon and uh, was restricted from what we could uh, understand to Latin America, uh, which was very special and uh, very unstable Latin America. Uh, it was never considered in development as a relevant issue. Populism was not. Of course, there was no short uh, supply of leaders, especially in Africa and Asia, who were designated as populists you know, from, you know, many decades, uh, because they made unrealistic uh, um, and uh, very um, uh, unwise promises. Uh, but to my mind, this is not really what we mean by populism today. It's not the fact that you make, uh, you know, uh, unrealistic or, uh, you know, crazy uh, promises. It's much more than that. It's very different. And we will be discussing that, uh, you know, much more later. So I'm not going to uh, spend time now at this stage about definitions. What I can say is that the, the recent surge of populism in the West, which is really a recent phenomenon, like in the last five or you know five years or so, 
especially since Trump, since the MAGA, uh, as, as was said, and since Brexit in the UK, uh, was a surprise, certainly. Even more of a surprise was the uh, spread of the phenomenon of populism in the third world, in developing countries. This is much less appreciated. Different forms of populism have taken root in countries as diverse as Brazil, as the Philippines, as Turkey or India. A recent, a recent tally by the Tony Blair Institute in the UK, using a very specific definition of populism and applying it uniformly across experiences, has identified over the last 30 years, since 1990 to now, 45 seven episodes of populist leaders taking power, 47 in 30 years. 47 held power during the period 1919-2020. Out of these 47 cases, 13 only were in Latin America, which was the only place where you could talk about populism like in the 50s and 60s and so on. But there were 19 in Central and Eastern Europe. We're talking about Ukraine here. Many of the Eastern European countries and Central European countries, including Russia, by the way, have had um, populist leaders over the last 30 years. Eight cases are in Asia and seven others in various countries like, like uh, Italy or the US or uh, Zambia in Africa and so on. Since 2008, there has been between seven and 20 populist leaders holding office at any given time for the last 12, 14 or 15 years. 17 to 20 at a given time are holding office. This should be compared to only four to eight in the early 90s. So uh, it was a surprise to see this emergence of populism over the last few decades and most specifically over the last few years in, in the West. But more significantly, it struck more recently, it struck more recently, much closer at home to me in Tunisia, a country long known for its moderation, relatively good management and stable politics. It was a big shock, in fact, but not a surprise to me. In fact, I started fearing for, fear, fearing for its emergence very early on in, let's say in 2017, in the wake of the so-called Arab Spring or the uprisings of 2010, 2011. Since then, since 2017, I became much more interested in the phenomenon. But still, it was a shock to me to see a populist president get elected so quickly, unpredictably, with a large margin in fairly open elections in 2019 in Tunisia. How could this happen? How could this have happened? I have been trying to understand, and later on I will say, try to say more about it because really this case, so trying to understand populism on this specific case has led me to try to understand more broadly what's, what is this phenomenon and how it works. So let me stop at this, at this stage and let me come back later. Thank you. And, th and thank you, Mustafa, very much. Um, very interesting questions, and we're going to get some answers before we're done today. Uh, Eric, um, you and I have had a, a brief chat uh, and with your colleague, uh, Paul Somerville, incredible book that you both have out right now on reclaiming populism. Now, Eric is the research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Growth Lab, and uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jim, and thank you so much, Sachi and Mustafa, for the uh, fascinating uh, introductory comments there. As mentioned, I'm the co-author of uh, this book, Reclaiming Populism, How Economic Fairness Can Win Back Disenchanted Voters, which I hope that anybody concerned about what's happening in Canada and around the rest of the world today uh, will find insightful. There are a few things that I, I want to say, and um, I think they really echo, in particular, Shachi's comments that there's a need to not be reductionist about populism and to think critically very, very carefully about the trajectory that so many countries are facing today because so many of the discussions in popular media are uh, frankly ultra simplified. Um, one element that I want to emphasize is that there is uh, not in fact 
a short time frame leading to populist eruptions like Trump and Brexit and the Gilets Jaunes. You can look at uh, indicators of political polarization, even increasing vote shares, for example, for the UKIP, the UK Independence Party in the UK. Uh, and there's, there's quite a um, strong consensus among uh, academics, actually, that the timeline of these uh, populist events really builds up over a multi-decade period leading to the flashpoints that we've experienced in the last couple of years. The other, um, the other element that I really want to emphasize is that populism is not a simple binary outcome. And this is something that especially gets uh, misrepresented in the media a lot. It tends to get discussed of in terms of you either have populism, you're either a populist country or you're a non-populist country. And I, I need to emphasize that nothing could be further from the truth. There are certainly cases that are, you know, um, eruptive cases, places like Trump in the US, uh, Brexit in the UK, uh, Marine Le Pen and the Gilets Jaunes in France, even uh, Five Star and the Northern League in Italy, that are the, um, you know, obvious cases of populism getting completely out of control and the most concerning cases, certainly. Uh, but it's important to emphasize that there are also lots of other countries where populism exists uh, sort of at a lower threshold and uh, where it can be maintained within a margin that doesn't lead to the kind of uh, disruptive events like Trump or like Brexit that leave the national character of a country fundamentally changed from what it was before to what it was after. To give an example, um, you can think of the Scandinavian countries in the 2015 European migrant crisis, where there was a huge influx of uh, refugees and uh, people you know, were commenting at the time because there was an upswing in vote shares for populist parties in some of these countries like Norway and Sweden uh, and Denmark and Finland. And uh, people thought, well, you know, are, are uh, they you know, going to go down this populist path? And once Trump and Brexit had occurred, there was every fear that that might happen in those countries as well. But uh, ultimately, when push came to shove, the, uh, the vote shares for some of the parties there, you know, capped out, for example, among the Sweden Democrats at around 20% nationally. And uh, in the 2019 European Parliament elections, uh, Sweden and Denmark, respectively, had vote shares for populist parties of around 13 and 10%, which were three to five times lower than in the UK, France, and Italy. So there's a very big difference between the countries that suffer the worst consequences of populism that forever changes their national character and countries that have some level of populism uh, within a, a perhaps somewhat manageable bound. Uh, and that ought not to be surprising because the fact is that every country in the world uh, has some anti-establishment forces. Now, the key reason for what differentiates those cases, as uh, we argue in detail in the book, is the extent to which citizens on the whole feel like the economy is fair. It's not a matter of simply whether outcomes in the economy are equal or unequal. It's about whether the reasons for success are fair, fair whether opportunity is equal and uh, reward is according to contribution. It means that in cases uh, like the US and the UK and France and Italy and other countries, uh, Poland, Hungary, et cetera, you have a system where people feel like success is the product of family origins and elite, ma elite machinations instead of, as it rightly should be, talent and effort. The problem is, you know, it's not that people want to eliminate the possibility of success, which is something that's often greatly confused from the left with their emphasis on uh, highly redistributive policies. It's that people want to make success fair again. And we, in fact, demonstrate that quantitatively in the research behind the book uh, by showing that uh, a measure of economic unfairness Low social mobility is a very good correlate of the incidence of populism around the world today. Uh, and in contrast, uh, income and wealth inequality are not. So when you have a situation where family origins decide success, uh, people think the system is rigged. And uh, what starts as an initially a selective issue with uh, a protest, you can think maybe of the, the Gilets Jaunes or even sensitivity, sensitivity to immigration, uh, as there were increased migration flows, for example, in, in Britain in the early 2000s. Uh, when that connects with a wider perception that the system is rigged and that the people who already are living there are being left behind, that can create a huge upswell of populism and lead you to one of the most dangerous cases where you get something like Trump or Brexit. Um, so thinking about countries like Canada and other countries around the world today, it's important to be very careful thinking about what outcomes are likely in the medium 
uh, term future to long term future. Uh, and also importantly, not to uh, rest on your laurels, because the fact is that social mobility is in decline in many countries, uh, it, even in places um, like Norway, which is famous for having some of the highest social mobility in the world. So there are deep questions uh, about how to defend social mobility and how to rebuild a fair economy so that citizens on the whole uh, do not think the system is rigged and in need of replacement. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, you use the word uh, fair again, and I, I can't get that out of my head of President Trump saying, make America great again. Uh, the terminology you use is, is, is fair again. And uh, uh, on this part of the conversation, we'll have about 15 minutes. I do have a few questions. And then of course, we'll open it up to questions from our, from our audience. And I think it's important that they get a few questions in, uh, very pertinent questions in because you, all of you have brought up uh, a number of, a number of, uh, of issues. Uh, and Eric, it, it struck me, you know, maybe I'll get Sachi on it. She hasn't turned her camera on yet, but we'll get back to her as well. But we can have this as a free flowing discussion about populism and why is it attractive? Is populism, for example, is it, is it different in uh, the uh, North American vehicle of populism? Is that different from the other grassroots that we see in uh, Central America or in countries in uh, the Middle East and elsewhere. So why is it attractive? And uh, please feel free to uh, feed off each other. So let's start with uh, Sachi. <laughs> I was going to I was going to invite Eric to start. Um, <laughs> I don't think people are are really conscious that they are necessarily attracted to populism. If I were to uh, poll Canadians and say, hey, you know, here are a bunch of examples of populist acts. And by the way, are you attracted to this? They'd be like, oh, that's terrible. But what they do find themselves drawn to is um, a community of thought, whether that's physical, virtual, online, that speaks to their sense of insecurity, their sense of grievance, their sense of, uh, to use that word again, lack of parity or lack of fairness. So when we talk to when we talk to people who subscribe to some of the same views that that uh, that we saw, whether it's with the Gijon or with the truckers or if it's anti-immigration, sort of what's the undercurrent or the beating heart through all of this? It very much has to do with a sense that these folks do not feel like they are able to get ahead. They feel like their period of entitlement or privilege, which are very loaded words, again, so let's let's try to think of them in a more academic or 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 cold way as opposed to in the way that it's that they're often used in today's discourse. The sense that I'm not getting ahead, my time is over. Um, things are not going my way, and uh, there is there is that that belief that there are others who feel the same way. So, what do you want to do? You feel scared. You feel angry. You you want to take it back. And I note in the chat uh, there was some questions about demography. You know, where do we see this? We see it with with men more than we see it with women. We see it with lower education individuals more than we see it with, uh, with uh, those of, of a higher education level. Um, and it's not necessarily about whether you're struggling economically, it's whether you perceive your ability to progress as being something that you can count on through hard work and, and other, uh, uh, other efforts or, or whether, again, the sun is setting on, on what you perceive to be what you're due or what you're owed. And, and I think that is, again, just that if, if there is an attraction or if there is something that brings people together, it's that. Mm -hmm. And Mustafa? I think you're muted, Mustafa. I think you're muted, Mustafa. It's a it's the word of the century. <laughs> I think you're still muted, Mustafa. I'll uh, let me tell you it's. Uh, can the can the administrator oh, unmute him? Well, um, 
So what we'll do is uh, we'll just go to Eric and uh, keep this conversation going, get back to what's up in a second, Eric. Yeah. Sure. So I, I, I would uh, really echo uh, Shachi's comments that it, it's, it's about, you know, the thing that tends to unify people in the most powerful way, getting behind populist movements is a sense of being unfairly left behind. And I want to be really specific that, you know, in the book, again, we show that this is associated with low social mobility and not income inequality. It's about unequal opportunity and reward not being according to contribution. And uh, it's often a lot more real than uh, imagined as, as some people might like to portray it. For a, a really concrete example, uh, you know, you can think of the way that uh, in the United States, the American middle class lives over a trap door essentially, that can be sprung by uh, ill health or unemployment or an accident because there isn't a social safety net in place, there isn't an adequate health care system, uh, education for retraining is very expensive, and the consequences of those uh, <coughs> failures have really intensified over the last couple of decades as we've seen, uh, you, you know, increasing globalization and technological change and the global financial crisis. You can think of all the people who uh, for example, lost their jobs due to trade competition with China in the United States, where uh, in, in that country, in the U.S., after that happened, you had so many people losing their factory jobs, and there was no statistically significant evidence of job recovery to offset that in the United States. But if you mm -hmm. do the same analysis for Canada, because we do have that superior social safety net, it's around half. Half of those job losses are offset by other gains. So it's really important to have, uh, you know, policy inputs in place uh, to support equal opportunity. And we also argue uh, for fair unequal outcomes so that people have opportunity and the means to translate opportunity to success. I, I, like, I, I like what you're saying, because I think that uh, politicians also have to uh, lower the temperature in terms of their own language, whether you're governing, you're in opposition, words really matter to everybody and words can hurt. And so lowering the temperature among politicians, I think, is key. Mustafa, you're back on. And yes. you really you wanted me? to... Yes. You me now? Yes, so really. thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think I'm going to defend a different, uh, different view. I, uh, I think uh, Paul and Eric's paper seems to be part of the broader, uh, you know, uh, work which focuses on what we call the demand side the demand side for populism. It really tries to understand what are the reasons that drive voters to go and vote for populist, uh, populist politicians and populist movements. And uh, I think whether they are, uh, you know, fairness, and I, I, I'm, I don't disagree with the idea of the issue of fairness is central and important and so on. But I think this way of looking and focusing only on demand is really missing the big, the big issue. The big issue is really on the supply side. And uh, that's what I am trying to kind of argue a little bit. Uh, the supply side to my mind really tends to be the major factor of success of populism. That means of populist reaching power. That is what I mean by populist. It's not the emergence of a movement in itself, but a movement which reaches power, which takes power. And, uh, I have been struck by the fact when we look at populist movements taking power by uh, two characteristics. One is that this tends to happen quite quickly, actually. It doesn't take decades for this to happen. It takes sometimes a few years. And I will I try to show that in the case of Tunisia. And uh, populist tends also to take hold and succeed really in context when the democratic system seems to be really becoming very ineffective and that the population does not feel that the system is meeting its needs. So this means that understanding supply side is extremely difficult. And that's why there has not been much work in analysis of what makes a supply movement succeed or not, even when the demand conditions are, are very strong. Uh, and the problem why it is difficult because the drive of populist public politics is really not on the rationality side. It's not rational. Populist movements are not calling on your rationality, on your grievances and so on. They're calling, but they're calling on grievances and calling on the emotional side of you. 
and populists are really, uh, you know, built around a narrative which is uh, built on emotions. And let me try to uh, explain this case, the case of Tunisia to illustrate my case because it's really very significant and makes the point. As I said earlier in 2017, I was mulling over the issue of whether there would be emergence of populism in Tunisia or not. Because I was seeing on the demand side, there were many, many features which tell me that there is room for populism to take hold. Because the issue that you are talking about, about fairness, about fairness only, or inequality were really, were really prevalent. Actually, the, the, the uprisings in 2010-11 the, the spring, the Arab Spring, was centrally about, about fairness, actually. It was about fairness and people feeling that the system is not fair, it was corrupt and so on. But then in 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15, populism did not succeed. Actually, there were many populist politicians who tried actually to come onto the stage, but they failed or succeeded very, in a very limited way. There was no success at all for many, many years. And uh, so, well, so I was wondering, is it possible for a populist politician or a populist movement really to succeed and come to power in Tunisia? Demand conditions were favorable. I could see it, I could tell. But could there be a movement which really provides the movement to which you know, voters will, will go and vote. And I was stuck with the idea that really, uh, that was very unlikely. Why? Because a uh, populist politician has to build a narrative and the narrative has to build a way of creating an enemy of the people. The good people are the ones whom the politician speaks for. And the politician in a populist movement has to be to create an enemy, has to get, get someone that is going to be able to be the enemy on which the narrative is going to be built and going to be attractive to people and people will vote. And it, had, it was very difficult to me in 2017 or 2018 to see what could be the enemy in a Tunisian context. Tunisia is a very, not very complex country, very homogeneous. Um, uh, very has been stable for many you know decades. So uh, there's no ethnic, there was no uh, external, there was no migration issue, there was nothing that you could make as really the problem that is really at the source of your of your difficulties. So I could not see it. I could not see this happen. But then all of a sudden, out of like out of the blues, you get a president in the 2019 elections, in a few months time, captures the majority of the electorate. A populist politician who has been succeeded, got 72% of the votes in recognized to be fairly open and fair elections. How? How did he, what, what is the enemy that he created to be able to succeed as a politician? And that's really typical, we can say that in all movements. What is amazing in this case is that the enemy was created out of, out of nothing. Actually, the enemy is still unknown, but it is there. It is there, but it's not there, actually. The enemy, the, this, the politician who is president today, the enemy are the corrupt, but he doesn't say who are the corrupt. The enemy are the ones who, uh, who plot against him. They plot in dark rooms, but really doesn't say who they are. He never names them. The, 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 he is there for the will of the people to go after these, these guys, but he never says who are these guys. But he's successful and people vote for him and keep supporting him even today after two years or more than two years in office. So, uh, how could this be? What is it? How could a politician create an enemy and create a narrative which is so successful and so strong and he has no agenda? 
He has no solution to anything. He is about corruption. He has been able to do nothing but corruption. He takes power and he grabs power after all, all aspects of power, but no, no really solution to anything. So to me, this remains a puzzle. How can a politician or any politician you know, come to succeed and convince the voters to vote for him or for her, given this, uh, the demand side conditions, given, given any favorable demand side condition, whatever they are, how in some cases a politician succeeds and is elected, becomes strongly and or no. I think we, we don't understand that, we don't know it. And let me say why, uh, and, and I, 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 I conclude with a different issue which also I think is, is extremely important. I think focusing on the demand side is really uh, risky because it does not focus on the main issue of bad populism. To me, the main issue of bad populism is when a populist movement comes to power, how to avoid that this, this movement does not translate into dictatorship? Because we know, we have known in history, that populist movements have a tendency, has an intrinsic tendency to, to mutate into dictatorships and into autocratic regimes. What is it that can we, we can do to avoid that? Even if, you know, populists can be useful, can be telling us something about society, about grievances, about whatever, but how can we avoid that they mutate into these dictatorships? And the other related questions, how is it that we can, how can we do what we should do to avoid the populist movements, which fail to succeed in doing anything about the problems they raise, they maintain themselves to power because populists tend to, to keep themselves in power by changing the rules. Even if they don't mutate into dictatorship, they change the rules so that they can stay longer and longer in power, even if they don't succeed. The typical example is Argentina. We cannot, we can tell you about Argentina for decades. You have, I think, uh, at the latest count, I think there have been, uh, I think, mean, seven or eight episodes of <clears throat> in Argentina. So that's, I, I will stop here, but uh, I, I was trying to take a different cut on the issue. Oh, uh, Jim, you're muted. It's an interesting uh, point of view because that's why I brought up the question of populism in this part of the world and other parts of the world and what it may or may not lead to. Now, we have a number of questions from uh, uh, folks who are uh, have registered, and I'm going to try to paraphrase them in a, in a minute. Time is moving quite quickly. But here at the Victoria Forum, we're trying to bridge divides. We can, we can, we can have the, the debate of what uh, populism means to each uh, panelist. But how do we reclaim populism and how do we bridge the different divides feeding populism uh, and I'd like to if you could be uh, succinct uh, the three of you and we'll go with uh, Eric first and then I would like to get a few questions in from uh, people who have registered for this webinar. Eric. Certainly so I mean something that I want to emphasize right from the get-go is that that mindset of reclaiming populism for the political mainstream is very important. Uh, you know, as, as the book shows, the, the populist forces in much of the world today, they depend on very real structurally entrenched economic unfairness. And you can't just hope that will go away or cause the or, or call these people deplorables and uh, insist that, you know, they just don't belong in the political discussion. Uh, the, the kinds of grievances that they have can lead uh, to, you know, if it's captured by the wrong politician, it can lead to a dangerous place. But those real grievances are structurally entrenched and thus you have to actually address them to solve the problem. Uh, now, in order to uh, reclaim that, there's, there's a variety of uh, approaches that are necessary, both in politics and in policy. Um, the, the first thing that I would emphasis, emphasize is uh, with regard to politics, it's important to be a little bit empathetic, you know, defend uh, liberal democratic institutions, defend democracy, uh, but don't just label huge swaths of the uh, electorate as, uh, you know, uh, whatever synonym for deplorable you want to choose, because that means that you're not going to be able to speak to them in any uh, substantial respect, and they're going to turn in the much more illiberal directions when they have these real grievances that you could channel towards making the country better. Uh, and from a policy perspective, in order to uh, rectify that structural problem behind populism, 
that low social mobility, that rigged economy of economic unfairness. Uh, we spend the last two chapters of the book, in fact, detailing the policy inputs to social mobility and how policymakers can figure out which areas need the most attention in their particular countries. It's too much detail to summarize, uh, to you know, explain in all its depth here, but I want to emphasize that uh, you know, we see social mobility as the product of very strong state support for equal opportunity, things like education and healthcare, but also protection against discrimination, uh, the financial regulations to prevent a, a, a financial disaster, combined with fair, unequal outcomes, because you need to have a competitive market so that people can translate opportunity to success. A really good case study of where that goes wrong is uh, the French state, where, for example, because its uh, taxation and social security contribution rates are, uh, you know, basically the, the highest in, of any high income country, you have situations where, for example, there are barbers in Paris uh, who, you know, according to The Economist, have to perform 200 haircuts in a month just to pay what they owe the state in taxes and social security before earning any take home pay. And that's why, precisely why uh, France has in fact quite low social mobility despite having such a large state. It hasn't embraced that, uh, that twin pillar of market competition combined with equal opportunity to support that. Uh, Sergi? Oh, you're muted, Sergi. I would simply echo the beginning of, of what Eric talked about, which was um, being mindful of otherizing people, even despite the, the general feelings of being horrified, uh, being exasperated, being angry with the behavior. Uh, I have seen people on Twitter uh, musing, and, and not that Twitter's the be-all and the end-all, but it is a forum. It's where people express things, um, you know, where where uh, the the convoy members were referred to uh, as as lost souls, or referred to, or or people asked open questions about the why are they doing this? How did we get here? And we're immediately attacked for those out loud musings for sympathizing with or, or not condemning their behaviors. We have to get past, if we are to make any headway around these discussions, the condemnation part of it to the why and the how and the wherefore. Um, and I, I, would, I would say that uh, against that backdrop, again, the, 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 the very distilled uh, political conversations we're hearing from our leaders, whether these people are heroes or these people stand with swastikas, like none of that is going to do anything to really underpin or understand where we're at. I would also say, because I'm mindful of time and I don't want to take up too much time, uh, we really do need to focus on stronger civics instruction in this country. I don't know how many of us could pass a social studies 12 class anymore, but at least I took one. I think most of us who are uh, part of this took one. The, the nice thing about these forums is that they are good opportunities for discussion. The problem is we're all we're, we're all the interested parties. We're the geeks all geeking out together, and um, and I don't know how much uh, the the important uh, pillars of of democratic learning are reaching those who who could probably benefit from it most. And and I don't just mean the populace, but also those who react to them. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, I really want to get on just a few questions from uh, the people who have registered for this very insightful webinar. And Mustafa, I'll certainly give you uh, a little more time. Um, but uh, some of the questions that are in front of me, if, uh, particularly one attendee, struck me saying that there are many of us for whom these kinds of populist revivals has resulted in broken friendships and relationships and accusations of racism and discrimination being thrown about with wild abandon and disregard for what those words really mean. And the question is, how can we be more empathetic uh, towards the underlying causes behind a friend or a relative's uh, a move towards a kind of reductionist thinking while continuing to combat their emotion uh, late at rhetoric. Uh, so there, there is that. I mean, this is, you know, in the province of Quebec in the FLQ crisis, I covered that way back when, and it broke up families. It was very difficult for 
the rest of the country to understand that, the emotion that takes place and these sort of things. And then there were questions dealing with, um, of course, the truck convoy here. And uh, but a lot of the a lot of the questions seem to be leading towards uh, trying to not appease anybody, but to make accommodation for others. And and I, I, this is where we're trying to get to with the, with the Victoria Forum is to come up with ideas to send to governments. Um, so if anybody wants to start, uh, feel free to do so. Mustafa, go ahead. Jim, Jim. Yep. Uh, I, I'd really pick up because uh, this question about the broken friendships and families and so on is really critical because I think to me, reclaiming populism is that's where, it, where the problem is, is how can we change the democratic political discourse? I think the democratic political discourse has been hijacked, has been uh, distorted. There is no rationality. Its emotions tend to be dominant. And I think we have to think how to make sure that the way politics is conducted, the way debates, the way political parties and so on are conducted, do not focus too much on emotions, but focus on reality, on facts, on rationality. And I think that is the critical point because populism tends to be really taking us into this wrong direction where we focus on emotions, on, on um, rejecting reality, creating its own reality. I think that's one of the features of populism. It has its own reality. It has its own facts. It refuses the reality and, and the facts debate is, is one typical example of that. But and, and to avoid this friendship, broken friendship and so on, I think requires that we go back to politics as rational debates, rational discussions about facts, about issues and about solutions. And I think that is the critical point of reclaiming populism. Eric, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 will, I, I would uh, echo the need to, um, you know, put emotionality to the side and, and focus, um, you know, empathetically and rationally on what are the problems and grievances that these, these people have, because even if it leads them to some sort of absurd conclusion, those grievances that are driving it are very real. And as a, as a consequence, uh, you have to be very, very careful. It's a hard thing to do, uh, you know, to be firm in, your, uh, in, in standing for liberal democracy and for the principles of a free and open society. Uh, but simultaneously recognizing that there are people who really feel like they have been unfairly left behind. Um, and I, I think the way to do it is to put all the, you know, vindictive sort of uh, the worst elements of the social justice movement to a side, to the side and uh, focus on the, the, real, uh, the real substantial issues and focus on creating solutions that work for everybody. Sachi, would you like to... Uh... In, in the interest of time, I, I don't have anything more more substantive to add that hasn't already been said. Well, uh, it's interesting when you talk about um, the, um, I was down and walking around uh, the, the truck convoy, and it's really interesting that you did hear uh, very friendly people uh, talking to you about why they drove all the way from Saskatchewan and why it mattered to them and so on. And um, I don't think others may have been aware of the, some other aspects of what this convoy uh, was about. And it, uh, but I, I find that um, when you pick up the newspaper, and I was a senator for 18 years, uh, and you're asked by a group of people to form government uh, with the governor general and, um, and take over what's taking place in Ottawa, um, it, it, that was difficult to digest because, as we know, our constitution, that's just impossible to do. But at the same time, there was this genuine feeling from many, many that they had come here with those, those grievances and weren't able to change anything through the um, voting or the, or the ballot. Um, the, um, the convoy keeps coming back because they keep talking about the United States and so on, and that people with populist ideas and um, and the populist movement elected a person like Donald Trump, who really, as according to one of the uh, uh, messages this morning, really wasn't, a, wasn't exercising populism once he got into power, which um, echoes what Mustafa has been saying, which took place in Tunisia. 
So getting back to where we're at, we don't have a whole lot of time. I've tried to paraphrase a number of the questions here. I want you to each uh, summarize what do you think very briefly uh, the next steps would be uh, for uh, this country and for other countries to, um, I guess the word is reclaim populism. Mm. I mean, populism seems to be sometimes is a dirty word in some quarters. In other places, it's a, it's a road to, uh, to, to what, as they described it, freedom, uh, and uh, and that's the way some people feel. So, uh, a short uh, summation, a short summation would be great. Let, let's not forget to your point, uh, Jim, that uh, that that it was a form of populism that actually brought uh, universal health care uh, under to Tommy Douglas uh, to Canada. Right. That that was also a populist movement of farmers. So uh, you can have populism for bad, which is what we are dealing with more now, it seems uh, around the world and particularly in Western liberal democracies. Uh, it can also be, to your point, a force for good. What happens next? I don't have solid solutions, but I do think this is a, a period of soul searching. And, you know, when, when I was really little, there used to be white papers and royal commissions that studied these things and blue ribbon panels. And then, and then the reporters of the day said, oh, why did we spend all these millions of dollars on these panels? And they ended up on a shelf and nothing happened. But perhaps this is a time to get back on the road for our lawmakers, our policy makers, our policy shapers to, to travel. I, I, I truly profoundly believe our journalists, particularly those who cover Parliament Hill, must start coming from other parts of the country and or our, our Parliament Hill reporters must be seconded to places like Calgary and Prince Albert and, and the Beauce in Quebec. Uh, among other places, to better understand this country, because Canada and politics does not begin and end at Highway 417 uh, along the Queensway. So I'll just say uh, there is an opportunity, I think, now for everyone to take a breath and to try to reach across the divide or better understand each other. I know that's easier said than done, but we can all try to find ways to consciously do that in our conversations, even with friends and loved ones and colleagues. Thank you, Mustafa, a minute, and uh, Eric, a minute, please. Just, Thank just you. one sentence. I think, I think what, what I take away is that really we need to figure out how to make sure that we avoid, uh, make, to make sure that we avoid that good causes are hijacked for the wrong reasons and the wrong directions. I think that's what populism tends to do. It takes good cause and takes it to a different direction for a wrong cause. And I think that's what we need to work out and find out how to avoid. Thank you, Mustafa, very much. Uh, Eric, one minute. Yeah, I'll say that, uh, again, something that we emphasize in the book is that you need to figure out how to solve that structurally entrenched economic unfairness. And uh, as we detail, the issues that you need to fix are really country specific. It's not like there's a silver bullet that works for everything. Uh, something that we practice at the uh, Harvard Growth Lab where I work and that we use in the book is something called the diagnostic method. And we explain that in the book, how you can diagnose what are the top constraints that most hold back social mobility in any particular country or region. Uh, and we, we think that this is something that uh, people in, in every country, including Canada, need to do. I mean, you know, there are, are uh, some areas where Canada has made good progress, like uh, the recent introduction of a national child care strategy. There are other areas that threaten equal opportunity, like the escalating uh, cost of real estate that um, could potentially price a lot of working class Canadians out of urban opportunity. Um, so there, there's a lot more focused work that needs to go into figuring out how do you bolster social mobility in this country and others. All three of you had valuable insights and I think it's extremely important to say this because uh, as a reporter, I just been thinking in the old days, in 1991, uh, shortly after the massacre in Tiananmen Square, I had talked to a lot of Chinese officials and they had said to me in my stories that I always, always stayed with them. And they said to me, Mr. Munson, you must uh, seek truth through facts. And I wondered whose facts? Hmm. Uh, because I guess my facts didn't matter to the Chinese government at the time because for them, it wasn't the truth. And from my perspective, I was telling the truth of what I saw from my, my perspective. We always must seek truth through facts. So that struck with me in terms of what social media 
and how we're living in this day and age with social media because your mind can be changed within a nanosecond of what somebody may say on there and then you run off uh, that way. But in uh, summarizing what you've all said, I, I just am struck by uh, Sachi and 60% of Canadians uh, feel the government is, is not addressing the issues of those who uh, are out there who are paying attention. That That's a big number. And uh, Mustafa, when you talked about, yes, populism movement can lead, and we've seen it, to corrupt leadership. And uh, that's what's taken place in Tunisia. And social mobility, um, I think it has to be explored uh, through your book and uh, encourage people to read Eric and, and Paul's book. But uh, for the, uh, the three of you, I want to thank you very much. Uh, life is always a learning curve. And even for a retired senator like myself, I've learned a lot today. And I want to thank the three of you sincerely. So with that, I think it's over to Adele Jutini and uh, he will sum up today's events and the events to come in the future. So stay tuned to the Victoria Forum. Adele. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. And uh, uh, first, uh, uh, I would like to, on behalf of the Victoria Forum, to uh, acknowledge the land on which we are, I am standing, so uh, Lekwanging speaking peoples and uh, the Songhi, was uh, Esquimalt and Wasanish peoples uh, on whose traditional uh, territories and the relationship with this land continue to this day. And I invite you actually to do the same. So I am Adel Gituni. I am the Associate Co-Chair of the Victoria Forum, so the other half of Sebastian. And uh, I am faculty with the School of Business. Uh, je suis Adèle Guitoni. Je, um, je suis le, le co-chair associé le, du, du, du Forum de Victoria. Et uh, je suis professeur à l'Université de Victoria. Au nom du Forum de Victoria, je tiens à remercier les, les panelists. It was an incredible, inspiring um, conversation. I think it opens up the, uh, the discussion. And I would like to invite uh, the speakers, uh, the moderator, and everyone uh, to continue this conversation in uh, Victoria. Uh, the book is available, and I, this is, uh, I think there is a thesis, but I like actually to see there was already in the question some pushback on, on the thesis. Uh, so I think um, Paul and Eric uh, are from this island, so I think we can have this conversation to continue. Uh, nous remercions, donc le, 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 le webinaire a été organisé uh, en collaboration avec l'Université de Victoria et, et le Sénat du Canada. Et nous remercions nos partenaires, TELUS et Van City, pour leur super, super, support uh, au Forum de Victoria. Uh, today's webinar uh, was organized also in partnership with the Center for Global Studies and the Canadian International uh, Council. Uh, sorry, I'm fighting my, my, uh, my slide deck. It keeps actually moving forward. Um, so the next webinars, on in a month from now, there will be a discussion on the role of the UN CFAL uh, on bridging divides through the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. So University of Victoria will be joining the UNITAR uh, and the CFAL network. Uh, on April 21st, um, we will have a conversation about uh, the global supply networks and the global trade and how we can build more resilience and sustainability in a very fragile systems. Um, and then on May 25th, uh, we will have a conversation on the power of sports for bridging divide. And there will be, it's around the truth, reconciliation partnership with indigenous people. So, um, aussi, je tiens à vous inviter à rester uh, à l'écoute pour une grande annonce pour un événement que nous, nous organisons en mai 2022. So, donc, we will uh, invite you to that event. It's going to be face-to-face -face event in Victoria and more to come. Um, the, this conversation will continue uh, during the Victoria Forum that will be held in Victoria on August 28th to the 30th. So it will be a face-to-face -face event, but also we will offer blended kind of participation for people to join us from around the world. Uh, le, forum de le, le, le Forum de Victoria aura lieu uh, à Victoria entre le 28 et le 30 août. Ce sera une excellente occasion pour venir visiter Victoria, mais aussi nous allons offrir la possibilité de vous connecter uh, par um, Zoom. On this, I would like to thank again the audience, 
uh, the, the panelist, uh, the moderator for this excellent conversation. This concludes today's Victoria Forum webinar. Thank you all for attending.